Thank you very much. Um, so obviously this is a very broad topic, and so what I thought I'd do today is cherry pick a few areas that I thought would be of interest to us as intensivists and might be relevant to us in our practice. So firstly, uh, in the last decade or so, the landscape in this area has changed quite a bit, and that relates to a few things, one of which is a number of jurisdictions and uh, Australia predominantly, a lot of extra resources have gone into improving donation rates. And this has been successful both uh, coming from hospitals and from community initiatives uh, with an increase in donor rates. But that is predominantly in the area of uh, donation after circulatory death. Those donors have really increased and have been rising. And also a number of transplant centers have what we call marginal organ programs, meaning organs that wouldn't have been considered uh, suitable for transplant in previous years are now being considered uh, provided they meet certain criteria. And this is made possible from advances like the ex vivo perfusion systems where organs like the heart and lung can be evaluated on a rig outside of the body um, and can be assessed and even resuscitated to a point that they can be transplanted. So that's a really exciting development. The other one is the safety and uh, efficacy of ECMO use in the post-operative period, meaning surgeons feel more confident about uh, transplanting organs that they otherwise might not have, if, even if they're not in great shape, knowing that the trajectory would be that that organ was likely to recover and the patient would need ECMO support for a while. So that's another thing. Uh, the availability of bridges, they've been there for a while. We've had ventricular assist devices, but they're getting smaller and easier to use. And it means that patients can have these devices whilst awaiting their transplant, improve their general health, mobilization, nutrition, etc., and be in better shape for their transplant when that comes up. With the lungs, that's a bit more limited, of course. The only um, bridge available is really ECMO. Um, but now, again, increasingly, uh, that can be used in suitable patients in an ambulatory sort of setting with, with patients being awake and not intubated and able to mobilize, etc. So that's another development. There's also more combined organ transplants, for example, heart and kidney, liver and lung for cystic fibrosis, for instance. And that increases the level of complexity and challenges that we have to face as intensivists looking after them. Uh, this is just some uh, data about the indications for transplants to give a general overview. This is Australia New Zealand registry data, but it uh, reflects fairly similarly with the International Society of Heart Lung Transplant as well. So you can see there for heart transplants, the two big uh, um, indications are ischemic heart disease and dilated cardiomyopathy with a smattering of another few things. Heart-lung transplant, it's not an operation that's done that frequently, um, only 198 in about three decades, um, and the majority is for congenital heart disease, Eisenmenger syndrome, and pulmonary, pulmonary arterial hypertension. What about single lungs? Again, an operation that's not done that frequently, uh, about 500 in the last couple of decades or so, um, mainly done for non suppurative lung disease, emphysema, alpha-1 antitrypsin, and pulmonary fibrosis being the, the big ones. By far the most common lung transplant operation done is bilateral lung transplants. And there you can see that the majority of indications are split between cystic fibrosis, emphysema, bronchiectasis, alpha-1 antitrypsin, and pulmonary fibrosis. In terms of survival, the survival with heart transplant is actually quite good. And you can see five-year survivals close to the 80% mark there for the heart transplants. The lungs not quite as good, and um, although the early survival is quite good, it drops off quite significantly, and that we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in the future. So looking after these patients, uh, lung and heart transplant patients, there are obviously quite a few similarities, but there are also some uh, interesting differences. And I like to look at them as masculine and feminine characteristics, if you like. I'll leave you to decide which one's which. But um, for the lung transplants, uh, like we mentioned, there's no long-term bridge available. It's just ECMO, whereas the heart, we do have that option. The lungs uh, tend to be less sensitive to donor factors like ischemic time, uh, reason for death, etc. Uh, also less sensitive to ischemia reperfusion injury as compared to the hearts. Uh, 
um, the majority of lungs transplanted these days, at least in our part of the world, uh, related to donation after circulatory death. Whereas in the hearts, that was not an option until recently. Recently, with the availability of ex vivo uh, perfusion, um, DCD hearts can be uh, transplanted, and some centers around the world are doing that now. The lung, of course, is exposed to atmosphere, and therefore any inhaled um, pathogens, etc., uh, directly hit the lung, and hence a higher rate of infection um, as compared to hearts. And then also there's the whole problem of bronchiolitis obliterans, which is a form of chronic lung rejection. That's a small airways disease that have, uh, is almost inevitable, but progresses at different rates in, in different patients, um, and is responsible mainly for the poor survival associated with lung transplants in the long term. The heart equivalent for that is chronic allograft vasculopathy, where there's a progressive narrowing of coronary arteries, which happens more slowly uh, and leads to progressive heart failure over longer periods of time. Certain physiological facts that I think are interesting and important to know. Uh, firstly, with the hearts, the rhythm, uh, it takes a while for the heart to recover its rhythm, usually two or three days, but a proportion of these patients will need permanent pacing um, mechanisms uh, for their rhythm. The heart is denervated, uh, the transplanted heart is denervated. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment, but it does rely uh, on uh, a while for the innovation to redevelop. Uh, diastolic dysfunction is almost universal in our heart transplant population, and that's largely related to ischemia reperfusion injury and the edema, et cetera, associated with this. Similarly, the lungs are denervated below the level of the anastomosis, which results in loss of the normal mucociliary clearance, a loss of a cough, whereas other things like vascular resistance, airway resistance, et cetera, are maintained. Drugs and the heart, so that's important for us to know as intensivists. And you can see there that drugs that uh, rely on innovation are not effective. For example, digoxin has no effect on the AV node. Similarly with atropine, um, with hydralazine, you wouldn't see the reflex tachycardia. Beta blockers might have an increased antagonistic effect because of denervation hypersensitivity. So for the most part, uh, these patients do reasonably well. And if we follow the principles Erica has just been talking about, about good cardiothoracic intensive care, pain control, um, circulatory and respiratory management, most of them get out of ICU pretty quickly. They're extubated in a few hours and leave ICU in a few days. However, complications do arise, and it's those patients that occupy a lot of our time and energy and also are the ones we remember. So talking about a few of this, these, um, one is primary graft dysfunction of the heart, and that essentially means the heart doesn't work when it goes, it's implanted into the recipient. And it occurs immediately, obviously, uh, and manifests as cardiogenic shock requiring support, either with inotropes in the less severe cases and up to mechanical support in the more severe cases, and requires for its definition the exclusion of other causes of uh, heart failure. These are the risk factors that have been proposed for primary graft dysfunction in hearts. Uh, they're donor, recipient, and procedural factors. Most of them are pretty intuitive, I suppose. So the primary graft dysfunction is generally due to pump failure. It could be of the right heart, of the left heart, or both together. Right heart failure, by far, is the more common uh, manifestation. And most heart transplants get some degree of right heart dysfunction. And that's because um, the right heart's most sensitive to ischemia reperfusion injury, as well as to the effects of cardiopulmonary bypass. Transfusion and protamine are other insults. And also these patients frequently have underlying pulmonary hypertension from their chronic cardiac disease. And the new heart is naive to these high pressures and struggles uh, to pump against these, um, this degree of fixed pulmonary hypertension. The principles of supporting the RV include optimizing uh, pacing to optimize cardiac output, optimizing uh, right coronary perfusion pressure with vasopressors is appropriate, avoiding big fluid boluses and keeping um, a, an ev a excess fluid. Uh, selective pulmonary vasodilators like inhaled nitric oxide or prostaglandins are useful, as well as ionodilators is appropriate for uh, augmenting contractility. 
With left ventricular support, similar principles apply, and one might argue for this patient population, it's sensible to go quick, uh, quicker towards mechanical support uh, to avoid the damaging effects that catecholamines have on the transplanted heart. This is um, from my institution, um, the experience of ECMO over eight years uh, for primary graft dysfunction, 50 patients who required ECMO. And uh, overall, 72% uh, survived to discharge, so pretty good, uh, with certain factors that seem to predict requirement for ECMO and survival. Primary graft dysfunction, the equivalent part of it for the lungs, that manifests uh, with the transplanted lung demonstrating progressively worsening gas exchange, decreased lung compliance, and bilateral infiltrates within the first 72 hours. And again, like the heart, requires exclusion of these other causes of lung failure. A a staging system has been proposed for severity. I'm not sure how useful that is clinically. But in terms of management, um, the principles of protective lung ventilation that we would do for any lung uh, injury apply. There are no big studies in these areas, so we've extrapolated a lot of the literature from other areas uh, with certain caveats. For example, the donor body weight should be considered while uh, calculating uh, tidal volumes for these patients. Um, as well as taking into consideration that there may be the size mismatch, which results in sometimes larger lungs being implanted into smaller thoracic cavities, resulting in collapse mainly at the bases, and this will need to be recruited. Um, and again, like the heart's early ECMO might be a way to pre prevent these damaging effects of ventilator-induced lung injury. A restrictive fluid strategy that's self-explanatory. It's a leaky capillary sort of situation you have from endothelial dysfunction. And also the use of pulmonary vasodilators. Inhaled nitric oxide may be particularly useful because it does ameliorate this ischemia reperfusion injury. Although like in ARDS, we're not sure whether it has any impact on long-term outcomes. We often joke in my institution that um, ECMO seems to be the meaning of life and the answer to all of life's questions. But I think in lung transplant, that is in fact probably true because it's used in almost every stage. We've already talked about its use as a bridge to transplant and even in ambulatory patients. Uh, we've talked about ex vivo perfusion uh, to assess the lung prior to implantation. Also, there's more data coming out now about doing the lung transplant surgery itself on VA ECMO rather than cardiopulmonary bypass. And there's a number of studies showing better outcomes with this and also ECMO for primary dust graft dysfunction afterwards for lungs, as we've just talked about. So having a robust and well-functioning ECMO service goes hand in hand with a good transplant service these days. So as an intensivist, rather than knowing uh, the definition, et cetera, what we would like to know, I think, as intensivists is if my patient with lung transplant has respiratory failure, over and above the normal things I would think of in a post-operative patient, what else could it be that's specific to lung transplant? For example, plural things like hemothorax, pneumothorax could happen as well. But other things include hyperacute rejection, which is something that needs to be recognized early and occurs due to the presence of preformed antibodies. Um, and fortunately, is rare these days because of better matching um, technologies. Ischemia reperfusion injury we've spoken about, which leads to global endothelial damage. Infections in the donor, particularly if they've had a long ICU stay prior to being donors, manif can manifest in the recipient. Also, airway anastomotic compl uh, complications with leaks, that's relatively rare. An important one to uh, recognize, though, is vascular anastomotic com complications, particularly pulmonary venous thrombosis or kinking, because uh, this can uh, cause a lot of trouble. It pre manifests as a focal consolidation on chest X-ray, and if it's not recognized and addressed early, can lead to a pulmonary infarction and infection, which can be quite problematic. So it's quite important to diagnose this, and it's, this is usually done by TOE and looking at the flow, uh, looking at flow acceleration in the veins. Size mismatch we've talked about, and squishing lungs into a, a small thoracic cavity can cause atelectasis. And the other one is phrenic nerve dysfunction. I think we've had a good talk about that earlier this morning, but uh, it's a, it can occur quite commonly up to 10% in lung transplant patients.
Respiratory failure down the track is uh, usually a differential diagnosis between rejection and infection, although both of them can occur at the same time sometimes. Uh, it's important to recognize, and it's being recognized more frequently, antibody-mediated rejection. Um, and because this uh, needs to be treated with plasmapheresis, IVIG, and CD20 antagonists. There are other differential diagnoses that can occur down the track, like airway complications or complications from a recent biopsy. Just moving quickly on to immunosuppression, uh, it's still a three-pronged approach that's used with steroids, one of each of the calcineurin inhibitors, and an anti-metabolite. In the context of acute kidney injury or a risk of acute kidney injury, calcineurin inhibitor sparing agents like ATG or uh, basiliximab are sometimes used as well. Calcineurin inhibitors obviously have an important role in um, preventing uh, rejection, but for us as intensivists are quite dreaded because they have a number of side effects that they come with, hypertension being one of them, which can result particularly in young women uh, in seizures and posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, which fortunately with control of hypertension and conservative me measures resolves. Nephrotoxicity, we all know, is a big one, and that can be either acute due to vasoconstriction or a more chronic form of uh, renal impairment. And sometimes you can get a microangiopathy with the CNIs, which uh, presents in the HUS-TTP-like spectrum, which can also contribute to renal dysfunction. There are some other specific uh, complications which I won't focus on. Distal intestinal obstructive syndrome, or DOS, is one of those that can be seen particularly in cystic fibrosis lung transplants, sort of a meconium ileus lookalike for adults, and has to be recognized early and sometimes requires surgical management. The other one is these patients are obviously prone, uh, increasingly prone to um, malignancies, like all patients on immunosuppression, but the lung transplants, particularly because of EBV infection, can have quite aggressive forms of B-cell lymphomas down the track. So to summarize, I would say that even though as intensivists we might sometimes feel like a very small cog in a very big wheel, I think the role we play is vital and is increasing uh, with the kind of patients we are presented with and this context that we are presented with, both preoperatively and postoperatively and it's certainly an interesting area to work in. Thank you very much for listening.